Good morning. Welcome to First NSB. We're glad to see you this morning. My name is Ryan Flint. If you're a guest in our service, I am the discipleship pastor. And uh, today I just want to open up with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be gathered in your house this morning. Lord, I pray for all of us here. No matter who we are, where we're from, or what we were going through this past week. Lord, I pray that you would help us to put all distractions aside. To lay all of our worries and our anxieties and our, all of our cares down at your feet. Lord, I pray that you would help us worship you in spirit and in truth this morning in song and the proclamation of your word. Lord, I pray you would bless this worship gathering and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us?
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted. Sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come forth. And fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what us long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Good morning, church. Hope you're doing well. It's good to see you this morning. If you are a guest, and maybe you came in just a little bit later, my name is Ryan Flint. I am the discipleship pastor here at First NSB. Our lead pastor, Pastor Luke, is out of town with his family this week. He'll be back with us next week, but he's afforded me the opportunity uh, to preach today and next Sunday as well. So, so my plan to have two consecutive Sundays is to do a very similar thing to what I did a couple weeks back. We did a, a three-week sermon series on rest uh, just a few weeks ago, and I know, like I'm just, I'm believing by faith that you took that sermon series, those of you that were here, and you've applied that to your life, and you've had the most rest of the last four weeks of all time. All right, I just, I, you don't have to confirm or deny that to me. I'm just believing that that has happened, all right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to have another short series, a little two-week series, but it's not on rest, it is on discipleship, which of course it's on discipleship. Again, I'm the discipleship pastor, so it just fits in really well. The title of the series is Home, and we're going to spend the next two Sundays talking about um, what, what 
discipleship looks like uh, today in the home, like in your family. What does family discipleship look like? And then next Sunday, we're going to talk about what does discipleship look like in the church home and like the family of faith that we call First NSB. So looking forward to today and next week, as, and I uh, hope you are as well. So we're going to open up in prayer, and then we'll get to work. All right, would you pray with me? Lord, we do welcome you into this place. You are good. You are perfect. You are gracious and merciful and loving. And the fact that even in this moment right now, you hear us is amazing. Lord, I pray as we open your word this morning that you would speak as only you can speak, and that you would use this imperfect vessel to communicate perfect truth today. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When you talk about disciple-making and discipleship, which are actually two different things, disciple-making is like this big umbrella, and then under that is evangelism and discipleship. So when you talk about both of those things, uh, every pastor that I've ever known runs to one particular text to get started, and that's exactly where this particular pastor is going to run. So if you've got your copy of God's Word, we're going to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to read verses 18 through 20. We'll spend most of our time in Deuteronomy, but we do want to get started here in Matthew chapter 28. For those of you that have a church background, you you know your Bible well. This particular text is, is very well known. It's known as the Great commission and it's Jesus's parting words to his disciples then and if you and I are believers today this command is still for us even now Matthew 28 we'll pick up in verse 18 Matthew writes this and Jesus came and said to them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. Jesus' command here is very clear. Go and make disciples. But there are three things here, three questions that I think just kind of naturally come from this particular text. The first being this, what is a disciple? It's a very important question. It's an incredibly significant question. What are we talking about when we talk about a disciple? Again, like this question alone could really take us the rest of our time together. And if Luke would give me more than two weeks, we could have a whole sermon series on it. Because we could we could go a long way about talking about what a disciple actually is. But for our time together this morning, I encourage you to consider the words of Pastor Jonathan Parnell, who writes this in a piece from Desiring God entitled, What is a Disciple? He gives this definition. The standard definition of disciple is someone who adheres to the teachings of another and is a follower or a learner. It refers to someone who takes up the ways of someone else. Applied to Jesus, a disciple is someone who, this is important, applied to Jesus, a disciple is someone who learns from him to live like him. Someone who, because of God's awakening grace, conforms his or her words and ways to the words and ways of Jesus. That is a disciple. We are called to be disciples and we are called to make disciples. This is the the mission of our church right now, to make and mature disciples of Jesus helping people learn from Jesus how to live like Jesus. So the first question answered, what about the second? The second is this, where do we make disciples? Like, where do we go to do this? And Jesus gives us this answer. We are to go and make disciples. Over the years, scholars and theologians have debated over this word go, which I always find to be very funny because it's just go how are you debating over go but they do and they've come down on two particular camps one 
one camp of scholars and theologians would argue that a more accurate interpretation would actually mean uh, going, or as you go, make disciples, which is a reference to how discipleship should be like a lifestyle, that in every intersection of your life, work, play, home, whatever, travel, like all of these things should have components of discipleship in them, and it, could ju- it should just be a regular, ongoing occurrence in your life. However, there are, there's another side of argumentation that would argue that if you do a word study of the Koine Greek word here for go, you will find that it's a participle of attendant circumstance, which I just learned what that was this week. And what it does, it focuses the reader on the action of the command. So instead of arguing over going, it's just a focused, hey, make disciples, go and make disciples. And it's, it's a much more active interpretation that that pleads really for, hey, wherever you're going, go. Go to the farthest reaches of the world to make disciples. So again, one interpretation seems to be a little more passive, while one is more active. So which is it? Yes. Right? Like, it's both. It's not an argument. It's not an either or. It is a both and yes. You and I should intentionally go out into the world to make disciples from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And yes, discipleship should be intentionally woven into our lives so that we can faithfully practice the commands of Jesus in our homes, in our places of work, in the grocery store, and walking across the street to our neighbors. But there is one place that we know specifically, very clearly, that we are called to make disciples. And that is the home. Scripture is very clear that the Christian home should function much like a disciple-making factory. We're in the Christian home. We are helping members of our family with added, intention, added attention to the next generation, our kids and our, our grandkids, our students. But all members of our family learn what it means to know and follow Jesus all the days of their lives. This inevitably leads to a third question how do we do that? Like, what does that look like? What does family discipleship in the home look like? And and again, a full-fledged, in-depth, completely comprehensive answer to that question cannot be boxed into a 30-minute message, which is actually going to lead us into something I'm going to close us talking about, so just hold on to that, but I'm getting ahead of myself. What I do want to do is I want to spend the rest of our time looking at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because there are some principles that Moses gives the people of God in Deuteronomy 6 that are actually incredibly applicable to you and I today as we figure out what it means to make disciples in our home. So if you got your copy of God's Word, turn with me, Deuteronomy chapter 6. While you're turning there, let me, let me talk to you for a second. When we talk about this, this idea of family discipleship, one of the first things that pops into people's minds is that we're talking about the home that is Uh, mom, dad, and two kids. The traditional picture, even in the sermon bumper, you saw the the mom, dad, the kid, and the dog, right? Like that picture, don't disciple your dog, that's all I'm saying. But like you, you get that kind of picture. And then if your family falls outside of that category, you might be sitting here this morning and going, this isn't my message. And I would argue that that's incorrect. That the Word of God this morning, though it does explicitly reference parents to students, parents to children, the principles from the text can be applied to your family, whatever your family looks like. Single parent with kids, it applies. Empty nesters, it applies. Grandparents that only see your children or grandchildren every so often, it applies. So so I, I say that to say as we get into this text, don't don't check out on me if you're not the mom, dad, and two-parent home as if this message doesn't apply, because I encourage, I, I encourage it does. It really, really does. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, Moses here is, in, is instructing the people of God based on God him, himself's instruction of him, and essentially family discipleship. What does it look like to help our families know and follow God? I'm going to read through this whole text, verses 4 through 9, and then we'll kind of walk back through it here in a few minutes. Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is known in Jewish history as the Shema. It's a particular prayer that Jewish people would recite. They would memorize and recite because they understood how significant it was in the life of their family to know the Lord their God. Jesus reiterates this in his ministry when he says the greatest commandment is actually found here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. From this text, I think there are four principles that I I believe we can take from these verses and apply to our lives as we consider what family discipleship looks like. Again, no matter what your family may look like. Principle number one is that our ultimate goal is to know God as Lord. Our ultimate goal is to know God as Lord. Moses begins this particular passage of Scripture instructing the people with this primary, um, incredibly significant, foundational truth about the character and the nature of God. He uses the word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is a reference to a particular Hebrew name of God that we would come to understand as Yahweh. It is a reference to the powerful and personal nature of God. So before he gets into any of the practical things, Moses sets the families of Israel up with this truth. Know the Lord God. This is the foundation of a Christian home. Who God is and what God is like. We have, um, we're in our house now. We're out in Edgewater. It's a wonderful house. Incredibly thankful to be out here and like have a place now that's our own. We've got all, we're, we're working on the decorations and all those sorts of things. But when you, when you talk about, you know, what kind of countertops you want or what kind of square footage are you looking for, or, you know, do you want carpet or tile, when you have all these questions, none of that really matters if the foundation of the home is flawed. Like if they, if they poorly built the foundation, you can have the nicest bathrooms eventually they're going to cave in and they're going to be unusable because the foundation's shot. The same is true when we talk about discipling our families. We have to be sure that we're building our families on a rock-solid foundation, and the character and the nature of God is that. So there, there are two things here. On the one hand, we've got to make sure, again, that we're rightly understanding who God is and what God is like. We find that from His Word. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But we also need to recognize that in the world that we live, There are a lot of other influences that are trying to sit at the foundation of your family as its foundation. Faulty foundation, like things, mindsets, belief systems that are trying to say, no, build your family on this and everything will go well, everything will be good. Let me give you a couple of examples. So on the one hand, you could have a a faulty foundation of building your family on this idea of happiness. I just want everybody to be happy. I want my spouse to be happy with me. I want my kids to be happy with me. I want, I, I want our family to be happy. And all of my decisions are made through that lens. All of the, the discipline of my home, is it, like it's filtered through that lens. Our schedule and calendar is built around this idea that I just want my family to be happy. And I'm no curmudgeon. I like to have a good time. I'm pro-happy. But that's a terrible foundation for your home. The goal of the Christian home is not happiness. It's holiness. And there are times where holiness doesn't always make me happy. But happiness isn't the goal. Holiness is to try and build your family on the foundation of just trying to make everybody happy is exhausting and impossible. It's a faulty foundation. We shouldn't live our lives trying to pursue that as as being the foundation of our home. Do we want our our families to be happy with us? Sure. I don't want to live in a home where nobody likes me. That's no fun. 
But the goal isn't, I'm going to do everything I can, everything in my power, just to make sure everybody's happy. It's not going to work. Another, another foundation that we can very, very clearly see in our world is, is what one generation will understand it as keeping up with the Joneses, while the other will understand it as the Instagram family. Okay? And again, I'm not anti-Instagram. I'm on it. But hear me out. Like th- this notion that I'm going to build my family up on the perception of those around me. Like we're going to go to the best places. We're going to wear the best clothes. We're going to have the best food. We're going to drive the best cars. We're going we're to live in the best homes. We're going to go on the best vacations. And before I go any further, I want to stop here. None of that's bad. Those aren't bad things. If you can and do and get and like, yeah, amen, go do that. That's fine. But oftentimes, the reason why, the motivation behind those things is not the glory of God. It's the approval and acceptance of those that follow you or those that know of you or this idea that I just want people to think we've got our family all all together. And that, too, is a detrimental foundation because there isn't a perfect family in this room. There are times I've thought we've gone on great vacations and like two hours in, we left a bag at the house and it was no longer a great vacation. <laughs> it's happened. Like, th- like things happen in life. That is a poor foundation. I could go on. I'm sure you could probably think of some examples too of poor foundations. The best foundation to build our homes on is God and our ultimate goal is to know Him as Lord. This leads us to Principle number two, that we are to know that the Lord God must be the Lord your God. This comes from verse five, that we are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. In short, you cannot make disciples in your home if you yourself are not a disciple. So, do you, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, whoever. Are you following Jesus? Have you repented and trusted in Christ and Christ alone for salvation? Are you growing closer to Him? Are you spending time with Him? Are you, are you to the best of your ability, trying to be obedient to what He's called you to do? You're not going to do that perfectly. None of us are. But there should be progress. There should be, maybe it's just baby steps, but baby steps is still baby steps. There's still movement. There should be some example in your home where you go as a leader in your home to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grow closer to my Heavenly Father. I, I know Jesus, and I'm trying to follow Him the best I can. And that example is what we need. Because to try and disciple someone to know Jesus and to grow closer to Jesus, if you don't know Jesus and are growing closer to Jesus, won't work. That's not how that, that's just not how that works. Growing up, I took a lot of uh, Spanish class in school. So in elementary school, it was like required. I didn't have a choice. But then when I got to middle school, I did so well in it, I was like, oh, I get to choose it. It's an elective. So, okay, these are easy grades for me. Let's do it. So I, I took it in middle school. And then the same thing happened in high school where it was an elective and I, I needed some easy A's and <laughs> that was one of them. So I, I went through four levels of, high, of Spanish in high school. So when I went to college, they were you know, pushing for a foreign language and they said, have you taken another language? I said, yeah, I've taken Spanish. I, I, during high school, I'd been on a couple of mission trips to Venezuela, so it was really helpful to know this stuff. And they were like, well, to take this placement test. I took the test. I placed out of 101 in college and took 102 and 201 in college. I was like a class or two away from like minoring in it. And I mean, I, I, can, I can read it. I can write it. I can speak it better than I do now. I haven't really practiced it recently. But if, if, you, were, if you were needing a low-level Spanish teacher, like I do believe I could step into that role. I could give you letters and colors and numbers and some basic vocabulary. I could conjugate some things. If someone were to speak Spanish to me, I could maintain a fairly regular, decent conversation. But if you were looking for a Chinese teacher, 
<laughs> I am not your guy, all right? I don't, I don't know how to write it. I don't know how to speak it. I don't know how to read. I know nothing. If you tell me that you need to fill, you need me to fill in a, Span a Chinese class to teach a class on Chinese, no one in that class is learning Chinese because I don't know it. And it's silly. Like, you laugh because it's silly. It's like, why would you, why would you even try to do that? that? That's the point. That, that we can't try and raise our families and grow our families closer to God if we are not trying to grow, grow closer to God ourselves. The Lord God must be the Lord, your God. The third principle is that we are to teach your family the word of God. Again, this is in verse 7. You shall teach them. The commands are in verse 6. Then verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Moses doesn't say just know the commands of God, like be able to answer questions about what the commands of God are, but the language he uses is it in your heart? It indicates that you are believing in these commands and you are walking in accordance with them. If we're going to disciple our families, again, no matter what our families might look like, the primary tool that God has given us to do that is his word. Where do we find Jesus' teaching? Where do we find other commands of God? Where do we find peace and encouragement and hope? It's all in the word of God. And this is not a revelation to you. I'm sure you are very aware. There is an all-out war going on right now against your family. And it's not with bullets. It's not with ammo. It's not with machinery. It is with the powers of the, the principalities and powers of darkness. And we don't really see that stuff often, but if we're paying attention to it, it's there. And we have an, a very real enemy that would want nothing more to absolutely destroy your home. But we're not sent into battle without a weapon. The weapon that we have been given to fight is the Word of God. So get around Scripture together. Talk about the Word of God together. Memorize Scripture together. Obey His commands, not just individually, but corporately as a family. I, I told this to the first service, and... I got a little uncomfortable saying it, but because it, it's confrontational, but it's true. If the only time your family sees you with this book open in here, you're doing it wrong. We have been given the word of life, not just for a worship gathering, but for our homes. Get your family around the word of God. Then it leads us to the fourth principle, and that is this, to redeem the rhythms of your family. Moses here, in verses 7 and 8, talks about some, specifically in verse 7, talks about some regular things that are happening in the life of the Israelite. You're to teach your children as you sit in your house, when you walk along the way, when you lie down, when you rise. Notice, there's nothing that Moses says that adds anything to the daily schedule of an Israelite at this time. Many times Christians struggle with this idea of family discipleship or, or, or growing their family closer to God because they believe, like they've, they've bought into this idea that what that actually looks like is that I've got to teach some seminary level theology course to my family every night during the week. And I don't know if you've tried that, Pastor Ryan. It hadn't worked for me yet. So I just stopped. But that's not what Moses does. Moses is not adding anything to our schedules. We're busy enough, and this is in the Old Testament. What he is saying is to recognize the regular rhythms of your day and redeem them. Do you have a morning routine? Most people do. Use it. Do you have a, a particular routine when you go to bed at night? It might not be the same time every night, but there's some keys in your home to know, hey, we're shutting things down. Use that. You might not go walk along the way with your family, unless you go walk on the beach, which is great. But you drive in your car. There's some of the best times I can remember of family worship or family discipleship is when all of my family was in a seatbelt. Because they can't go nowhere. <laughs> Nobody's leaving the car, all right? Redeem 
the regular rhythms of your family. There are things that you do on a regular basis. It's not that like every moment of the day is, is like you know, but like they're, you know what I'm talking about. There are just some regular things that you don't even think twice about doing because you do them so often. That's the instruction here. To take those things and redeem them for the glory of God. These are ways that we disciple our families. That we help them know Jesus and grow closer to Jesus all the days of their life. So, it's one thing, which is a good thing, for a pastor to say, hey, here's, here's the text. Let's walk through the text. Let's talk about how many times you can understand the word go, right? Like, let's, let's do these things. And those are important things, and those are good things. It's also beneficial at times for someone to go, okay, here's how my family's trying to do this. Like, that's a different conversation. It's not that my life is inerrant compared to the Word of God. It is not. But my family is trying to imperfectly practice this in our homes. So I want to give you just a, a sample of like what it looks like. Not again, not because we're crushing it or because like we've just, we've nailed this and we're like, no, that's not the case. But we're trying. Like I'm trying to help my wife. Like we're trying to help our boys. We're trying to help our family grow closer to God. So here's what it, here's what it looks like on a regular basis. Okay, number one, we are active in the church. Stop. I know I'm the pastor. <laughs> if they weren't active, it'd be weird, right? So take that aside. I get that. But I was raised in a home, and my wife was raised in a home that valued what we're doing. And whether God had called me to ministry or not, I firmly believe we would still be active in the local church because it matters. Like this here matters. I'm going to say something else that I might lose friends on. Like, for those that are watching online, I love you. You're great. I'm glad you're viewing it. Like, I'm glad you're here with us. I'm grateful for this, this medium that we have. Being in the room is different. It just is. Like, there's something spiritually different with gather, physically gathering with the saints of God on a weekly basis. If you can't be here, I respect that. Admire the fact that you're still tuning in. But if you can, we'd love to see you next week, 9 and 1030. Because it's just different. Being a part of the body is different. So we are, we are, I encourage you, as much as you can, yes, people get sick, yes, there's vacations, yes, people are, I, yes, I get all those things. But as much as you can, as a family, be plugged into the local church. Another thing that we do is that we have, and we started this when Eli was like, maybe three, I think. We do uh, family devotions, okay? We don't do it every night of the week. If I told you it was every night of the week, that'd be a lie. It's not every night of the week. It's maybe four nights, maybe. And during the summer, it's all messed up. Summer schedule has us all in a whack. When school starts, it's much more regular. But what we do is every, most nights, not every night, most nights, we'll go into one of the boys' rooms, and we'll sit down. I've got this little devotional that we're reading, okay? We're not talking Wayne Grudem systematic theology. We're not talking intro to New Testament one. We're talking Veggie Tales devotional. Okay, it's Bob the Cucumber and Tom, whatever those names are. Okay, whatever their names are. It's them, all right? And the book, like if I, th I thought about bringing it this morning, the book looks like it's been run, ran over with a truck. I mean, it's like falling apart. But we use this book, and we'll sit down multiple nights a week, and we'll get around the Word of God, and we'll talk about this little devotional, what it means, how does it play out in our lives, what could, what could it mean for you tomorrow at school? We'll pray together. Hey, hey what do you... We're talking about what we're thankful for. What are you thankful for? We want to build a spirit of gratitude in our boys. Well, I'm thankful for this toy. Okay, I'll run with that. Like, I'm not going to argue with you right now over this. We could, there's a lot more to be thankful for than this little Pikachu, but I, okay, we're good. We'll go there. But th this is what we do. We talk about, like, but we also want to, like, speak over them, like, look what God has done. Like, God has brought us to be a part of a great church, He's moved us here to a great part of the country. Like, 
We're 20 minutes from the beach. It's awesome. And we want to reiterate to our boys, this is not happenstance. This is a sovereign God that has worked out all of these things to put us right where we are. And we're thankful for that. And again, we, we pray together. It's not every night. And I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't tell this the first service, I probably should have. It doesn't always look neat, okay? Like, it's not always like both of our children crisscross applesauce, hands in lap, just waiting on their father to instruct them with theology. It, that's not it. Like, I, don't, I just want to be real with you. Like, that's not the picture. The picture is often, d- s- sit. <laughs> sit down, dude. <laughs> if you don't, keep your hands to yourself. Like, that's a real picture. But we're trying. We're trying. We sing a lot in our car. A lot. I got a family of four. One of them should be singing because she sings really well. You're going to see her sing here in just a few minutes. The other three, it's just a joyful noise, okay? Like, it's not, <laughs> you're not going to see us go on tour anytime soon, okay? But we sing. It's a, like, me, like Christian godly music is a significant influence, and in especially of young minds. Like, music is a very unique medium to communicate truth. So when we moved down here, we found a Christian station, and this is, I'm not trying to be super spiritual here, I don't know of any other stations on the radio than the Z. That's all I know, because that's the only thing I play. We might listen to some YouTube playlists or some things here and there that are still predominantly Christian, but that's it, that's all we know. And it is such a joy. It happened yesterday to be riding down the road, and all of a sudden, I'm not even paying attention to the song, but I got two little voices in the back that are singing every word, because it's just become a regular rhythm of what we do, and they've heard these songs so much that they're just, they just sing them. I don't, they probably don't know what they're singing, but it's ingrained in them, because we've, we've shown it to them so much, or we've modeled it so much. And then the last thing, started this last year with their boys taking them to school, because I, I was the one in our family that was able to take them to school most mornings. So from our house in Hickory to where um, Eli's school was, was about 15 minutes, and I stumbled across a podcast. It's called God's Big Story, for those that want to <laughs> check it out later. But it's about a 15-minute podcast from the Village Church out of Texas, Dallas-Fort Worth area. And it's a, it's a Christian kids podcast where they have, I think they're on like season six now, They've gone through the Old Testament, I think it took two seasons. They've gone through the life of Jesus. They've gone through the fruit of the Spirit. But it incorporates Bible lesson, songs, and there's like a little review game at the end. And it just happened to fit in the window of taking my boys to school. So what we would do is on Monday mornings, we'd load the van up, we'd drive to school, and I would cut this on. And they would, they would listen to it. Maybe we'd talk about it if there was a little extra time. And then before my boys got out of the van, I'd pray for them. And I would pray the same thing for those boys every day. They could probably quote you this prayer <laughs> because they've heard it so much. But before they, got, they get out of the car, I have prayed that, Lord, that you would help them be a good leader, a good listener, a good student, and a good friend. Because if, if you can nail those four things, I, we're working with something there. If I can get a five-year-old and an eight-year-old to be a good leader and a good listener and a good friend and a good student. Okay, I can do that. Every day. We're speaking this over the life of our kids. So two things before, before we go. One, I, I recognize, and this was true in the first service, that everyone in here does not fit that mold. Like you're not in that season of life right now. So it might be nice to hear what the Flint family is doing, but it, it's just, it's going to look different in your family than it is in hours, which is fine, but it, it just is going to look different. So I, I'll point you back to the text itself. There's nothing that Moses tells us. There's nothing that Moses teaches us. There's nothing that the Word of God says that, like, that we haven't talked about this morning that could not be applied to your family, whatever your family looks like. You and your spouse could talk about the Word of God together. You could pray together. If you only see those kids and grandkids every so often, when you have them, pray with them. Pray over them. Listen to Christian music. Like these are, these are small things that we can redeem the regular rhythms of our day to make a spiritually significant impact in those that are in our homes. Last thing I want to say is this. Again, everybody's not going to fit into the season of life that we're in. I'm very aware. 
but some are. I want to let you know something that we're starting next Wednesday, okay? Because I'm really excited about this. Next Wednesday night, our Awana ministry starts back. Super pumped about Awana just in general. Our Awana ministry is phenomenal. But what we're starting this year alongside Awana is that we're, gonna, we're starting a new First NSB group and a group that is specifically geared towards parents. Parents of kids, parents of students. I, it doesn't matter how old your kids are. If you're in the home, you're welcome to be a part of this group. Because, it's, again, it's one thing to sit here and spend 35, probably, by now, minutes on talking about this. It's another thing to get around godly people once a week and go, hey, how does this look in your home? How can we be praying for you? How can I be praying for your kids? How can we love on and encourage and support one another as we're trying to raise the next generation to know God and love Him? Because if you're trying to do that on your own, it's almost impossible. So I want to let you know that. Those of you that are in here that fit into that season of life, hey, I've got kids that we, we have strategically planned it to occur on Wednesday nights during Awana. So your kids are getting discipled down the hall and you're getting discipled in here. That we, as families, can grow closer to God. Be more faithful in our obedience to His commands. And raise the next generation to do the same. To make and mature disciples. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that where we were once spiritually orphaned, by the blood of Jesus, we have been welcomed into your family. That even in this place right now, we are a church family, and what a gift that is. Lord, I pray for all of the families that are here. There isn't a perfect family represented. But Lord, I pray that you would do a mighty work in their lives. Whether it's just a husband and wife in the home, whether they're kids or grandkids, whether they're students in the home, look, whatever the family looks like, Lord, help them grow closer to you. Help them glorify and honor you in all that they do. Lord, help us be a church that equips families, no matter what they look like, to serve you more faithfully, trust you more fully, and to lead others to do the same. Lord, we love you. We thank you for first loving us. I'm going to pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
NSB, we're so glad you joined us this morning. We're especially thankful for any guests that may have joined us either online or in person. If you're a guest, we ask that you text the word guest to 386-777-1417 and a member of our team will respond to you. If you are visiting us in person, we ask that you take one of the Let's Talk cards in front of you, in the chair in front of you, and take it out to the table at the main entryway, and our pastors will be there to greet you, and we will have a token of our appreciation to give to you for visiting us today. Another way for you to find out more information about what we have going on here at First NSB is our Next Steps class. Next Steps will be offered on Sunday, August 21st at 4 p.m. If you are interested in attending this class, please text the word Next Steps to 386-777-1417. Parents and grandparents, mark your calendars for Wednesday, August 17th. That's the night that our Awana programs start back here at First NSB. It's a great place for your kids and grandkids to come and have fun, be with friends, and to learn what it means to know and follow Jesus. Along with our WANA ministry starting on August 17th, we will be launching a first NSB group just for parents. This will be led by Pastor Ryan, myself, and Brooke and Adam Stubbs. This is for parents of infants all the way up through high schoolers. If you would like more information about this group, please reach out to Pastor Ryan. First NSB is an incredibly generous church. 
All the contributions given by our members and regular attenders go to not only fund ministries here at our church, but also locally in our community, in our state, and around the world. If you would like to give to the mission of First NSB of making and maturing disciples, you can do so through our First NSB app or our First NSB website at firstnsb.org. You can also give as you're exiting the worship center in the giving buckets or in the kiosk in the cafe. Thanks again for joining us for another great day of worship here at First NSB. Didn't she do a great job? That was great. She probably hates that I just said that, actually. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this place. We're thankful for the opportunity again to gather and worship you this morning with our family of faith. Lord, I pray that we would take serious the call to make disciples in our homes, no matter what our homes might look like. Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength to do that you would help us to be obedient to that end. Father, I pray you be with us this week in all the places that we go. Help us to make and mature disciples wherever you've called us. Lord, we love you and we thank you for Jesus and we pray all these things in his name.